Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Future Forward Security and Staffing Summit. Today or this afternoon, we're talking about security for QuickBooks 2023 and beyond. And our speaker is Kelly Parks. I'm Gary Dehart, and I'll I'll be the guy in the uh, in the background running the polls once I do what I have to do, which is share some housekeeping information. So number one, yes, this is a CPE eligible webinar. So just like all the other webinars, you have a few things that you have to do to qualify. You have to be on the session for 50 minutes, five zero minutes, and you have to answer at least three of the poll questions. I don't know if you have, yeah, five zero. I don't know if you have three or four in the, in the, um, in the slide deck, I can't remember. So you got three, so don't miss any. You have to answer three. And if you do qualify with your 50 minutes and your three set, three poll questions, we will send you an email uh, probably tonight that um, links over to a survey. Complete that survey. It's just three questions about the, the, the webinar, the speaker, the topic, and then you will receive your CPE certificate. If you have any questions, put them into the Q&A panel, uh, the, the box down on your in your tray. And I will, Kelly, is it fine if I put this presentation into the chat for people as well? Is that good with you? 100%. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'll put a PDF version of that. Once Kelly starts, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel. I will put the link to that in the uh, chat as well. And then everyone will certainly receive an email within 24 hours or so with the link to the YouTube channel and to... Um, the what's the other thing youtube channel and oh the slide deck yes there we go that's why i need my cheat sheet in front of me but i don't have it so all right i'm going to turn this over to kelly kelly's going to tell you who she is and why she's here and wow us with uh with her depth of knowledge on this subject thanks kelly thanks for being here um thank you for having me uh i'm gonna wow people oh dear that's a uh that's a big intro and I just want to start by saying I see uh, lots of new faces in the session and because I can see the attendees and I see uh, lots of my regular friends. So hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. And I appreciate you spending the time with me. So we are going to do a session on security for QuickBooks. We are going to cover desktop and online. So we're covering basic security for both of these. And um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And I will, I, I said to Gary, I'd like to take some questions along the road too. My number one goal here is to make this session about you. So if I'm getting ahead of myself, if you have a question about something that I've said, let's make sure we get them answered. So we keep this focused on everybody but Kelly. Although Lordy Lordy knows I will try uh, to make it all about me. Sorry, my thing doesn't want to move along here. Okay, if your practice is based on QuickBooks for your accounting software, you must ensure that all the cybersecurity gaps are covered. That includes if you're integrating other applications into these programs, because both desktop and QuickBooks online, not just the online, desktop as well, connects with web connector or some direct integration with outside applications or with bank feeds. So if you're integrating with other apps, if you have multiple team members on the platform or you are sharing information with clients in any manner, this is all before we even talk about where the security threats come from. What we're gonna to cover today is having a backup routine, the importance of a backup routine and, and how you're going to establish one. That your security is only as good as the lowest of your users, and that includes your clients. I want to ensure that you have a series of backup reports, although I'm going to talk to you about backup applications and running backups. It's key that you have a series of reports so you always have a point in time of what the books look like so that you have something to go back to uh, restore the file to. I'm gonna talk about three location data redundancy, huge. So I'm Kelly Parks. I'm a certified professional bookkeeper up here in Canada, but I spend a good part of my year in the United States, either vacationing, which I'm about to take six weeks of coming up, starting next week. So either vacationing, or uh, if there's an accounting conference going on, I try to make my way there. I love being with other accounting professionals. Y'all are my people. 
I am a member of the International Trainer Writer Network. I am a member of the Fresh Books Accountant Partner Council, and I am certified or partnered in over a dozen cloud applications. I also, so I have a bookkeeping practice as well. I take on hot mess clients and I do security audits for them. One of the service offerings that I offer, and I have some regular monthly client work as well. I also work with accounting professionals um, developing processes and I have um, pre-built templates just to uh, get y'all started without having to uh, do them yourselves. So where are the threats coming from? Natural disasters, personally, recently explain, uh, experienced a fire in our own building. This is our second one and I'm gonna tell you about data location redundancy savior in that one. Um, of course, we've had all of the hurricanes, prayers out to everybody in Florida, especially Fort Myers Beach area. Um, bad people, they're out there. Team errors, client errors. So both of these um, are, are ones that having a backup process can mitigate. The team errors, if if people are putting in, I don't know, I'm just going to pick a topic here right off the top of my head would be journal entries that cause havoc, or you have um, that you has gone unnoticed is entries that are completely incorrect. Can you go back to a point in time? Client errors. Uh, I had an example of a client that attached a file, uh, attached an outside application that brought data into our QuickBooks online file. They did that themselves. So they, um, they attached an application and uh, I needed to roll back the file to a point to get those transactions that had automatically come in. She also set them to auto enter through the bank feed. Oh, sorry, I moved out of my uh, thing here. Okay, one of the most important things you can do is set up a backup routine. That means that you, especially in QuickBooks desktop, that you have a closing procedure and backup routine for that desktop file. It's not just important where it goes, it's important how often you back up the file. There's a number of reasons for this. One of them is um, desktop will alert you to um, file location er or file data errors. I think if you've got a, if you're using backups in QuickBooks desktop, you will have seen this, that it tells you that, it, that there's a problem in the file. And those problems, if you catch them in time, are usually fixable. But there is a point where the corruption of data is so bad in the desktop file because it has not been backed up and then it has not been fixed, that you cannot fix that file. So make sure that if it is telling you there is corrupt data, that you run a rebuild right then and there and backup routines will help you spot those. Even if you, and I see this often, even if you host your QuickBooks desktop file, um, you need to back it up. Again, this goes back to the spotting errors before the file is corrupted, but beyond repair. But also you are, have your file hosted by some of these fantastic host products like Swissnet or Qbox, Right Networks. We're gonna talk about those in a minute. But you still don't have a way to go back to a point in time for all of the reasons we just mentioned above. So you cannot be beholden to outside applications looking after your backup process for you. QBO backs up all client files on the whole. It does not back up individual client files. Although you can't set up a backup routine through QuickBooks natively like you can through the desktop program, you can set up uh, some outside applications, we're going to talk about that in a minute, that backs up the individual file data. So here are the backup routines. Uh, every fourth close minimum. Backing up the the running a backup though. Uh, I ran a, I, I ran a backup every single time I closed 
a file and I closed out desktops every single day. When I was done working on desktop, I closed the program. When I closed the program, I had it set to automatically run a backup. If file is not data heavy, if there is not a lot of transactions going on in there, you could set it to close uh, every fourth. That would be the minimum that I would ever recommend though. Make sure you're backing that file up. One of the, one of the key things in deciding how often to back up that file is how much information you would have to recreate in the file if you can't just restore a backup. So that would be the key thing to take away from it. Or, so the most important thing would be transaction load. How much do you have to recreate? And the second most important thing would be, what is the client doing with that file? Does the client need data out of that file for any reason all the time? If they do need real-time data, even in the desktop programs, make sure you're closing every, or make sure you're backing it up every single close. So do you want to override the previous one for year ends? So uh, when I am doing a, a backup, I run a number of, I have a couple of different backup routines in desktop. One of them is that uh, every fourth backup on the regular basis gets eliminated. So we only have four working backup copies at any given time and they are date stamped so that we know what to go back to. But we also have a monthly backup file that is then moved out of where the normal backups go so that nobody puts the wrong one up, but that we always have a point in time at the end of the month for those files. And then I do a year end backup close. So a, a year end close backup. And that goes into another location again. So we don't restore the wrong file. Um, but that we have a point in time at the end of the year. The other case that I would be doing it here in Canada, we have a VAT sales tax. If I needed that for audit purposes, let's say they're in an audit position, but now we're moving on to doing day-to-day -day bookkeeping, but we need the books to be exactly as they were in the point in time, I would run a backup and keep that backup for that. Make sure that you use the proper naming convention. So it doesn't matter what your naming convention is, but it needs to make sense to you. So when I'm talking about about those monthly ones, they need to have, let's say, the client name, the month and year that it was closed, and whatever might be of importance to that. And then the same thing, it would be the client name, year end, the, the, na the, the date of the year, so year end 2021. And maybe if they, have a, if they have an off calendar, if they have a fiscal year end, make sure that you put the actual month in. So it'd be year end May 2021, for example. And then especially for these ones that you're keeping so that you have copies of historical, not just to restore more current versions, make sure that you have those backups copied in a number of locations. I'm going to talk about location redundancy for everything through this chat. So location redundancy means you would have a copy of the, the year end backup. The client would have a copy of it. Make sure you're empowering, you're empowering your clients with their own information so they don't always need you. And um, make sure that you have one, let's say, in a uh, storage site that you control, a storage site that they control, and then on a server of some sort. And uh, some people would put those on a stick as well. So make sure you have location redundancy of the backups. So I'm just going to take a sec second here to take a look at a question for QBO standard backups. What does that mean for the client? Can you provide an example? Virtual server fails and that client file is gone. What does Intuit do to get the client up and running again? And how does that, how long does that take? It is highly unlikely that if a single client file, the data is gone, that they can restore one client. The exception with that to be is if you're running um, QuickBooks Advanced, and you have the uh, backup, Chronobooks was the original name of it, Intuit bought Chronobooks and embedded it in the advanced version of the product in the USA only. And that, um, that will back up to a point in time. If you use Rewind, and we're ahead of ourselves here, 
um, on QuickBooks desktop, on QuickBooks Online, but I'm happy to, to be ahead a bit. QuickBooks Online, every other version, I recommend you run something called Rewind for the backups. And um, when you are using Rewind, you can back up at a transactional level and you can back up at a point in time for individual files. So Julie, I hope that answered your questions. I have a little clicker that moves my slides along, but not if I've moved the clicker off of the slide. Okay, so Gary, you're up. We're gonna have a poll question. So do you have, oh, go ahead, Gary, do you wanna read it? Nope, actually I had something else, but all right, we'll let them read it. Um, while that's running, while you were talking, I totally realized that I, or I realized I totally forgot to mention our sponsors. How terrible, bad person of me. So uh, we do wanna say thank you to the sponsors, which are Tech Guru, uh, Davo by Avalara and Swiznet. And you mentioned Swiznet. It's like, oh, I didn't say anything about the sponsors. So again, uh, thank you to Tech Guru, Davo by Avalara and Swiznet for sponsoring the Future Forward Security and Staffing Summit. Thanks. And uh, sure, Gary, uh, and, yeah. and actually, I'm going to take a minute to talk about Swiznet. Uh, totally off topic uh, because it's not in my slide deck. Gary doesn't know this is coming. This is totally off the cuff. Gary's worried right now. So I was at something called Appy Hour Camp two weeks ago. And at Appy Hour Camp, which was, a, it was a retreat for educators in the accounting space. And I was so honored to be invited. It was fantastic. And there was uh, some of the app partners there so that we could have direct contact with them of our needs, our wants, our wishes. And I met the people from Swissnet. I have met them at a number of conferences, but you don't really get in depth. I was blown away by how smart these people were, how they had thought things through. I, I can't say enough actually about how blown away I was by how all encompassing the knowledge of the people at Swissnet was. It was one of my big, and I hate the term takeaway, but it was one of my big takeaways from uh, Appy Hour Camp two weeks ago. Okay. So 53% of you have a backup policy. Uh, I am really hoping that by the end of, let's just call it the end of this week, you start to put a backup policy in place, um, especially for those desktop files. Uh, make sure that you have a routine and you have a naming convention, you have those backups going somewhere. And for QuickBooks Online, we're gonna talk about backing up those files in a second. And I hope you institute some of the policies I have on that. Okay. Do you have a backup poll? Yes. No, not fully enforcing and no. Uh, teens hosted desktop. Here are some of the suggestions that I would make. These are the big three in Kelly's humble opinion. So that would be QBox, Swissnet, and Write Networks. Please don't use Dropbox. I started using Dropbox in 2010. Dates are fuzzy. To back up. Uh, my QuickBooks desktop programs because I was already working remote. So I had my clients uploading PDFs of documents to Dropbox and then I was hosting the files on Dropbox. It worked fine until it didn't. So when you hear the Dropbox corrupts files, it, it demoed our payroll. Luckily, we had backups and we had reporting on it. But in the end, Dropbox did corrupt the file. And even though I was backing up and thought that I was fixing the file, it did not fix the file when it was hosted on Dropbox. So don't do that. Uh, I already mentioned that even if you were on some of these hosted programs, please make sure that you are still backing up the file. Um, so QBO, Intuit backs up all files in one lump sum not as in individual files, which takes us back to the question. I'm using Rewind. There is, as I mentioned, a backup routine or a backup program in advanced only, but that does not leave uh, a lot of wiggle space for uh, redundancy of data. So the data that is in Intuit's programs. And I love Intuit. I think the word has gone out. And I'm a, I'm a QuickBooks gal, especially QBO. But I don't want my source documents solely hosted 
in the Intuit products. And I certainly don't want my data solely hosted in Intuit. There is no data location redundancy if you have it all in one place. Rewind backs up the entire file or at a transactional level. Uh, as I mentioned, the Chronobooks product in advance backs up only at a, um, at a uh, uh, date level. So you can restore it only to a point in time. But you still need to know what reports, you still need reports to know what to fix. So even if you have to go back, you need a comparison of where you think you went wrong in the file. So make sure that you have a regular system of running reports. I have an automated system that we're gonna talk about uh, in a few minutes on what reports you need to run for that. So passwords and two-factor authorization. Your security is only as tight as the lowest of your users. Make sure your clients are using secure passwords and 2FA. One of the things I do when I do a security audit for new clients, which includes backups, it also includes passwords and 2FA, is that I try to get them on the password manager bandwagon at the very least, uh, I have them create completely ridiculous passwords and give them basically a system of making sure they are never using my dog name, one, two, three, four, exclamation mark. Not that anybody is doing that. And please explain the importance of two-factor authorization to your clients. I realize it takes an extra five seconds, but it could take you who knows how much time and money if you don't have that two-factor authorization. I'm gonna talk about two-factor authorization tomorrow, but in, in a nutshell, that gives a second line of defense to somebody getting in. If they know your password, they still can't get into the program if they don't can't access your two-factor authorization. You can do it by text, by email, or using an authenticator. If at all possible, use an authenticator. Again, I'm gonna talk about this tomorrow, but for those of you that won't be there, the difference between using an authenticator is you go get it, the new 2FA code. If you have it emailed to you, or if you have it sent by text, it can be intercepted. And the bad guys are really smart. Intercepting is no big deal for them. Make sure your team are using secure passwords and 2FA. Close the desktop at night. I actually close my entire computer every night. So not only would I close out of a desktop program, I close out of QuickBooks Online, I sign out, I do all the right things. I shut my computer down at night. I'm gonna talk about this tomorrow. But if you close your computer down at night, a bad guy can't get in unnoticed. Most, most of the big breaches actually happen during the nighttime hours or the biggest one, you can look this up, I'm not making it, is on long weekends. Well, and it would take companies the longest time to notice that there has been a breach in their um, security. So close your desktop at night at the very least, but I recommend turning your computer off every night. It's also good for the health of your computer if they're fairly new machines. Payroll in QuickBooks Desktop has a 90-day password policy. This is when it would be really handy to use a password protector because you've got to change that password every 90 days when you are using QuickBooks desktop. So make sure that you have some sort of policy that um, even if you're not using a password manager, but please, please, please use one. Um, even at that, uh, even if you're not using one, make sure that you have a series of passwords that are completely unrelated to each other. So don't change the last thing or the first thing on that password, which I see all the time. They change an exclamation mark out to a question mark and they think they've changed their password. Please don't do that. So Jean, Jean. So I just like to say, I saw Jean last week at Happy Hour Camp and um, Jean and I have done some stuff together as well. What is the best practice for using 2FA with QBO? If you use 2FA, QBO prompts you Every time you log in, that's not bad, except when QBO bounces you out repeatedly. Yeah. So um, in order for QBO to bounce you out less, clear your cache in the evenings when you are done working or clear it first thing in the morning. I clear it because then it logs me out of all of my programs. That will keep that to a bit of a minimum. Gene, uh, and again, please use one where, where you use an authentic cater for QBO don't have it sent to you but uh, I don't there's no solution for that 
you are going to have to put it back in every single time. So you're just going to have to take the pain of that. With my authenticator, it probably adds an extra two, three seconds to the entire process. Do I resent it? Yes. Every single time I'm like, ah, and I make the face. Sometimes I actually make the noise out loud. But again, a data breach is a lot more painful than putting in the two-factor authorization. So sorry, Gene, that was a total non-answer. So we've got a poll, Gary. Uh, so we're going to put up the poll question. And do you require yourself, your team, and your clients to use two-factor authorization on cloud accounting programs? I'm going to throw out a little question that is not related to the poll, but do you require it on all cloud-based programs? I do. I have it on, on, on everything but one program of mine. One program doesn't use it and uh, it's killing me, but I love the program so much. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shout them out. They're working on it. Um, it's one of the questions that I ask about apps and we're gonna come to apps in a minute, um, is does your app have two-factor authorization and does it use an authenticator? So 34% of you, you've got your app hanging out there, you're naked, you're unprotected, please activate two-factor authorization it is the single most simple thing after complex passwords but complex passwords can still be hacked two-factor authorization i've only heard of one example where they disabled the two-factor authorization on the platform but it was one that was emailed it was not an authenticator one. So please use two-factor authorization no matter how painful it is. Hey. Gratuitous dog photo. So anybody who uh, reads my blog, I'm not expecting that many of you do. This is Ipit over here on the right. She's our enthusiastic dog and this is Shark. She's our good dog. Uh, what is an authenticator? Is it a plug into a USB port? No, Linda, actually an authenticator is an app. It's like a Google app. I have two. One, the ones that I need to share with my team member, Marissa, are on a product called Authy. So I'm not sure if you can see that. I'm showing it on my screen instead of my face. It's on something called Authy because it can go on multiple devices. So Marissa and I can share our authentication there. Or there is just a Google Authenticator. There's a Microsoft Authenticator. There's all kinds of authenticators. It's an app that lives on a, a mobile device. And tomorrow we're going to talk about how do you share the two-factor authorization. Okay, backup reports. You need to know what your data you are correcting back to. So where did things go wrong and what did they look like before they went wrong? In QuickBooks Online, you can create a group of reports and email them on a schedule. Um, you can, uh, so my reports include the general ledger as an Excel file. Uh, QuickBooks, you will need a second group to do this. So QuickBooks Online, you need a second group because if you create a group of reports to have shipped around or you can download them, if you create a, a group of reports, you can download an entire group in one click. If you hit the button, it will download the group as a single PDF. Um, so that's super quick. If you'd rather download them, then email them because I understand the security issues around emailing them for sure. Um, so download or email, you will need two groups though. Um, one group for the Excel file and one group for the PDFs. I do them as PD, except for the general ledger which I want as an Excel file so that we can sort and filter, especially in the event of an audit. But the uh, other reports, I want them as a PDF. So I have an absolute point in time that nobody can manipulate. And I know they can manipulate them, but not if I've got the PDFs. So the PDFs, data location redundancy, the clients get a copy, I get a copy. Trial balance, profit and loss. I know you're all thinking right now because you're accountants you're going and, or bookkeepers, you're going, trial balance, you've already got the profit and loss, you've already got the balance sheet, I want to make it even easy for my clients to know what's going on, they don't read trial balances. Accounts receivable, and of course, accounts payable. This gives me an absolute point in time. My routine on these reports, if the client is transaction heavy, those reports are weekly. 
if it is a regular ordinary sort of file, those reports are monthly. It's based on transaction load. Okay, so how do you know? I'm going to take a question. Noah, how do you force two factor authorization for staff members? Uh, this is part of getting your team on side. Um, it needs to be a policy. It needs to be a policy. Some applications, I'm just going to call out a payment processor called Pluto. You can force it. You can actually say, yes, all members must have two factor authorization. Um, no, I don't know how to control staff members. <laughs> it's way out of my purview, but it should be a, it should be a policy. And if they aren't doing it, if it's part of your policy, I might make something security like that, a fireable offense. That's harsh, right? Do you ever use the export feature in QBO for file backup? Uh, if you have so, have you used the export to recover transactions? The only export feature that I am doing is these backup reports. So I am not doing lists. When I when a client file is done, I am doing lists. Um, this is a really good point, and this is why I love questions. Mm, in Canada, it, or not in advance, this is not something that you can just export everything all at once. You have to go into export and export all those client lists, all the chart of accounts, all of those things. Chart of accounts, uh, we're going to have them anyways, but George, this is a really good question. Um, so me, no, only when I am ending a file do I export all of the lists. Hmm. How's that? More non-answers. Uh, data location redundancy. Uh, reports. Uh, this is my system, QuickBooks. It goes into Dex, and then it Dex automatically downloads into a client-controlled storage folder. So I use Dex. Dex is a document management application. And everything that my clients, all source documents, AR is emailed out of QuickBooks. So invoices that clients create in QuickBooks are auto emailed into Dex. And then all um, AP goes into Dex from the client. And then everything is downloaded into a folder that the client controls. This goes for the reports are going into Dex so that the client always has those reports as well when you've disengaged a client it's really nice if they have all the reports they need and you don't need to get them anything the quicker a disengagement happens the more peaceful it is for everybody quickbooks custom email so uh i though i'm just saying whether you believe in emailing reports or not i would not email any information where the clients have vendor contracts for example um some of those things so decide what you're comfortable emailing and what you are comfortable with downloading but if you are using uh email um you can send them to a reports an alias email and then they can be uh you can use a filter in the email program to drop them into a client folder uh you can also use something like zapier to scrape them into a storage folder so there's a number of ways to do that I've given you links on how to schedule desktop reports and how to schedule QuickBooks online reports. You need to create groups. Desktop backups on a C drive, on an external hard drive. I'm just giving you a couple of ideas. On a server and or a USB stick. Again, get something into the hands of the client as well so that they always have those reports. Where can we download the items? So Gary has actually put that into the chat, but I don't think our chat goes out to everybody. Um, so some of the stuff is going in, but Gary, I think only hosts and panelists can see our stuff. So I'm sure he's gonna send it to you after. Extra security, users, make sure you're checking that audit log. Uh, every once in a while, have a routine going into the audit log seeing who's doing what in there, um, making sure. So if you have a policy that says your team members need to be logged out at night, you can check that audit log and you can filter it by user 
to make sure they are in fact logging out at night because some people, including Kelly, use something called tab reloader. So QuickBooks Online, you can set it so that you log out every three hours instead of every one hour. But if you're inactive for any reason, even in less than that three hour time frame, sometimes it kicks you out. So I have a Chrome extension that reloads um, my apps on a schedule. Here's another little tidbit of information. It is, it is dictated by Intuit that connected apps like Dax, like Pluto, whatever it is that you're using as an outside app, it is dictated by Intuit that they automatically log out after half an hour. It's a security thing that Intuit has put in place to save us from our silly selves. Um, but Tab Reloader can keep the page moving even if let's say you're on a call and you want Dex to continue to stay open, Tab Reloader. Audit log, the minute, <laughs> the minute somebody is done work in any of these files, delete these user immediately. Uh, when I do a security audit, I've gone into some of these QuickBooks files and people have been in there that have not done anything in these QuickBooks files in years. Get rid of users right away. Um, integrated applications. Before, before you remove yourself from a QuickBooks file, disconnect every single app that you have control of. I actually take it next level. I disconnect apps that my clients have put on there. And the reason is, if you take yourself out of QuickBooks Online, and I, to be fair, I don't know if this is the same thing in QuickBooks Desktop, but it's really important. If you take yourself out of QuickBooks Online and you have not disconnected the likes of HubDoc or Dax or Pluto or Melio, the audit log will show the administrator of those apps as continuing to work in the file. So if you are the administrator of Dex, you connected it, then you disconnect yourself from the QuickBooks file. The audit log isn't going to say Dex is adding this. It will say administrator Calm Waters, that's my uh, bookkeeping company, is making those transactions in the file. That's dodgy bits of business. So make sure, and you cannot go back and redo that. You don't get a do-over on this. Once you've removed yourself from the QuickBooks file, it's not like you can add yourself again and then disconnect that and get out of the audit log. So in the early days, I had a HubDoc file that I did not know this. And so I had to send my clients essentially, because almost all of my engagements have been graceful. So I just sent them a client a note and I said, hey, Kelly was a dumb dumb, didn't know this would happen. Uh, I need you to sign an agreement stating that any of these types of transactions are not actually being done by Kelly. And please check the audit log every once in a while and you will verify that no other transactions other than this transaction type is being done by Kelly because that way they can see that I haven't been in there for any other reason than the HubDoc file was connected. So make sure, I cannot emphasize this one enough. It's a bad look for you. Um, have a schedule that you review integrated applications. So go into those applications, go into the account version, go into apps, check on the health of those apps. Um, if it's a low touch client, you could do this quarterly. If it's high touch client, do this monthly. Make it part of your routine that you go in, you make sure that the apps that they have connected are all still necessary. And you make sure that the apps they have are, are connected properly and functioning properly. And when I was at Appy Hour Camp um, two weeks ago, um, QuickBooks or Intuit is working mightily on a whole dashboard for us to check the health of the apps. And I was like, hallelujah, this is going to be such a great feature. So they understand the importance of it and that is coming as well. So review those integrated applications and anything you don't need attached to the file, get rid of it, kick it to the curb. You should have a system for vetting your apps. You need a minimum viable product criteria. 
That means what are the minimum things that you will allow for an app? I don't allow apps. For example, I have the one app that doesn't have two factor authorization, although that makes me a little insane. It's not the end of the world. I'm using a password protector and there isn't client data in it, yada, yada, yada. And it is not connected to my QuickBooks file. I highly recommend minimum vial pro minimum vial. Oh, Kelly, minimum viable product criteria. Make sure that that includes two-factor authorization. And if at all possible, make sure that that criteria, as I've already harped on, involves an authenticator. I think that that is the very least that we should have as a security. I also try to find out what is the country of origin of that app. Are they SOC compliant? That's SOC. Don't ask me it, just it's important. Um, what is like, what is all of the level of their security? Is this app one guy, one girl, or does this app have a team behind it? I actually have what's a 30 minute form. It takes them about 30 minutes to fill out a form for an app to even become, and, and then they have to do a demo with me and we have to discuss all kinds of other things. If they don't make it through this form, we don't even do the demo part. I know that that's a little over the top and I actually do do work as part of, it's a revenue stream for me. I work with applications on development and all kinds of stuff. So um, I'm, I'm way out ahead of this, but make sure at, at, that you at least create a list of what's some of these criteria are going to be. And you can do a point system for evaluation. We love spreadsheets, right? So you can have the points going down one way on certain things, and then you can have the other criteria so that where is the intersection and where do the points add up? We love point systems, I'm hoping. So make sure that you have some sort of way to evaluate the apps. Ask your friends as well. There's um, Facebook groups, I know, roll your eyes at Facebook groups, but man, oh man, there's community in there. People know about these apps. They're happy to help you out. The app partners are in a lot of these and my personal Facebook group, you can't be an app partner in there until you've gone through quite a rigorous process with me. So find a way, don't just willy nilly add an app because the client asks you to or a team member thinks it's a great idea. Okay, so we've got a poll question, Gary. I'm still awake. Poll okay. is posted. Although the poll is for our CPE credits, uh, mostly we're just checking to see if I put Gary to sleep, right, Gary? <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, okay. So, do you review what apps are connected to your QBO files regularly. And again, Intuit is working hard on this, and I got to be a part of a focus group of all of the things that we want. And I know I need a life, full disclosure. I love this stuff, especially the security stuff. Um, it was so fun working directly with them and I cannot wait to see the implementation phase. Um, We're gonna go ahead and close this out. So if you need the CPE, make sure you get this. I'm gonna give you a few more seconds and then we will share the data and then move yep. on. All right, closing out. Okay. So only 57% of you are reviewing the apps that are connected to your, your QBO files. I said QBO in here, so I kind of made a I, I kind of made a, a misstep here. Um, QuickBooks Desktop, you can also connect a lot of apps. So make sure that you are reviewing the necessity of the desktop apps as well. Uh, and just for fun comment, there's a lot of magic in the desktop. I worked fully remote, fully paperless in desktop files before I moved strictly to online. And it was magic. So document management at the front end, payment platforms at the back end, host the whole thing on SwissNet. And for crying out loud, you're working remote, you're working in the cloud, and you can work whenever the client needs the stuff doing without running into the office. So desktop is, and bank feeds, the bank feeds in desktop, the whole thing is stinking magic. So don't give up on the apps on desktop. Um, you asked about apps connected to QBO files. So I just have something in my way here. 
So what? Oh yeah, so review the apps. Get rid of the unnecessary ones. Make sure they're functioning as they should. Uh, you ask the apps connected to Cubia. So what if we are the invited accountant and not the owner of the QB file, do you still make a distinction by the two? Brad, are we talking about disconnecting the apps? I, I'm going to give you an example, and you can reword the question if I'm not giving you the answer correctly. So even if the client owns, so uh, I had a client that came to me, they have, they are the master admin on QuickBooks. Uh, I, they came to me with HubDoc. So we disconnected the, I take a lot of the love them and leave them. It's not that I'm running through clients like it's nobody's business. I actually do project work as part of my business model. And um, so I'm constantly onboarding, offboarding. And the, um, if they come to me with the apps already in place, we do it together. If I can't disconnect things, I have them do it with me. And I phrase it that this is for their assurance that I am completely out of the files. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you meant. If you can't disconnect the apps or you don't have ownership, how do you do it? Um, I still do it no matter what would be the answer on that one. And I think we are at time, right? We were 10 to, uh, I would love, uh, Gary, are we allowed to have questions at this point still? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. So if anybody uh, has any, no, there was a hand raised earlier. It seems to have been put down, but it was by Christina. Oh no, it's still up, Christina uh, Kitsos. So Christina, if you have a question, throw it in the, uh, in the Q and A for us and we'll get that answered for you. So uh, those of you who know me, and again, thank you. I see some of my friendies in here. Um, <laughs> uh, you know that it's a rare occasion that I'm done on time, but here I am done on time and I managed to stay on topic. So nobody is more surprised than myself. But if there aren't any questions um, related to specifically Intuit security issues, Gary, if you're game, I'm I'm game for a free for all of questions, whether they're related to security or something random. I'd love to impart whatever somebody would like to know. Sure. Um, so does not have to be security or QuickBooks related or something that I went over too quickly. So uh, I'll throw out a couple of things. Just one. Um... I did put the links to the ch in the chat to the the links that Kelly had, so um, you should be able to see those. They went to everyone. Then I'm also adding into the chat now. It's a link to um, the IRS Security Summit. They they put together a uh, a template for a uh, a WISP, and so we we have that hosted uh, just for people to take a look at that, and then. We've talked about it in the past couple of sessions, but you know, I think one of the key things from the other sessions that um, I think it was a gentleman from Swiznet said was, don't just don't take that document and just put your company name on it and say, oh, I'm covered. Here's my here's my uh, my wisp. That's not what it is. It has to be about your business. If it's not about your business, then it's not valid. So uh, use that template. It is there. And if you need those other links, let me know. Uh, we do have a couple other questions that have rolled in here. Kelly, if you want to take those. One of them is a great one. Yes, I do know of a Intuit security issue, and it makes me insane. It's related to um, data integrity. So <laughs> um, when it, not in desktop, this is a QuickBooks online issue. So when you close the books with a password, uh, I don't always give the password, obviously, to clients because uh, some days I can be a dingbat about doing uh, transactions in a past period. Asking a client to be 100% aware is going out on a limb. So first of all, make sure you close those books so that you have the changes to close books reports. Um, but you can totally bypass that. None of my clients know this. I'm hoping a lot of clients don't see this webinar. I sh but uh, you can, so if somebody says they did not make changes in a past period, you can check the audit log, but 
to open books in a closed period without a password in QuickBooks Online, all you have to do <laughs> is turn off, close the books. And there you have it. That's it. The other thing I really wish we had, and none of the products have it, nothing, no accounting program has. I wish we had multi-level close. I wish we could close from certain users. I wish we could close, uh, we could close the year with one password. We could close last month with another password. We could allow non-posting transactions like estimates to become in invoices into the current period. I could go on all day about closing the books in a much more robust way than we have in any of the programs. And I'm not just talking into it programs here. So yes, that is a security issue, um, but it's more related to data integrity. It is not related to like a gateway to get into the product. How do I go about, um, about checking the security pro protocol of a connected app? I'm not sure what question to ask. I hear you. This is a tough one. Um, I know the questions, but I, that would be an entire session that we would have to do. But the most important one is going to be, not the most important, you want to make sure that they are SOC is the acronym. You can look it up, SOC certified. It's, um, it's a certification that they need. It's like the starting point, really. Um, you want to find out. So a lot of them will tell you they have bank level security. Google, what is bank level security? And then go ahead and find out, ask the app, do you have this level security? Don't use the term bank level security. Google bank level security and then come up with what that term is, I can't remember. And then ask the app that. Um, uh, I would ask, what's the size? What's the size of the program? How many people are there involved in the company? How many are on the development end, on the sales end? I would like to know the size. I don't want these little guys going away and not knowing what's happening with, um, unless you're willing to be in beta on your own file. Um, I would ask them, I, I like to know the country of origin. I also like to know where the data is hosted. I will allow it to be hosted and no offense to my American friends in the United States, but we have stronger protocols in Canada and Europe right now. If, they, if the data is hosted in Europe, that's gold, man. That is the gold standard of data security. So um, I would ask where the data is stored. I would ask them about data location redundancy. Are they just on one Amazon web service or Azure? So ask them what their service is. Is it Azure? Is it web? Is it AWLS? Um, I would ask them who they're hosting, who is hosting their thing. And then I would, I would ask how many farms they have it on. So make sure that they have data location redundancy, that they are not just hosting on one site. Um, those are the questions that come top of mind to me. Uh, Gary, in a minute, is going to list the host, uh, list the apps and sponsors again. And then Jean, uh, we have, so Jean says, we have had our clients start to focus on their security internally. Yes. And ask us about our procedures. Having procedures and security requirements up front is helpful when this happens. It's a group answer. Jean, I could not agree more. And tomorrow, we are going to talk about crafting a security policy. And I always, always do a security audit with my clients. And then they get the full meal deal on implementing a password app on implementing two-factor authorization. How are they gonna get rid of users in these apps? How do they onboard employees? How do they offboard employees? All of those things. So we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. Um, and, oh, I hope I say this right, Mobilia, just cool name. Uh, very informative webinar, thanks. Yeah, okay. um, I am a new bookkeeper, even though I have been a tax preparer enrolled agent for 25 years. Oh, are you guys going to provide the recording? Yes. Uh, so you must have come in a little late. Gary did the housekeeping at the beginning. Yes, to the recording. And uh, hallelujah to you people who prepare taxes and, and take the burden off of those of us who are too lazy to do them. Thank you. Um, data location, can you speak on Intuit's? Karen? Uh, so uh, my friend Karen um, is asking about data location. Uh, Intuit does does have data location redundancy. So if a couple of farms go down, the server farms go down, they've got the data located on a number of them. Do I know how many? No, I couldn't come up with that off the top of my head. 
Um, and, uh, but that's it, that it's still all lump sum, not individual files. Uh, and that's, that's the only intelligent, that's as far as I can go on it, Karen. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think we are at time, Gary, because you probably have some uh, wrap up. Oh, thank you, Linda. Linda thought it was an excellent webinar. She learned a lot, very clear. I'm oh, tooting my own right. horn here, Gary. You should cut me off. I, I pulled the plug. <laughs> all right, I'm going to have to mute you. So go on your six week vacation already. Can I answer one last question from Karen? Karen wants to know is the data stored in Canada? It is stored in a number of countries from Intuit. I did not answer that question. Yes, Intuit stores it in a number of countries. You need Fantastic. to check, uh, Karen, you're asking, I know because you're a fellow Canadian, I know you're asking if it's stored in Canada. I would send a direct question uh, on, on that to Intuit. But yes, multi-country. All right. Is that really the last one you're going to answer? I'm done. Unless right. they want to ask me more questions about my dogs. <laughs> I used to have a dog look just like your, your tricolor, exactly like that one. And, was she, uh, she he enthusiastic as well? Uh, yes, until she, she lived a long time too. She was like 18 or no, 15, 15. And we ended up having to put her to sleep, but uh, she was a great dog, super smart. So, but thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking some time uh, and just sharing your, I knew we'd have a ton of knowledge coming at us and we certainly appreciate it. One thing I've learned today is I need to do better better passwords and uh, make sure I have two-factor on everything, which I don't currently. So uh, do that both business and personal, right? So uh, I do want to say thank you again to our sponsors, which were Tech Guru, Devo by Avalara, and Swiznet. You can certainly find them on um, just on the internet. You can find them on our website as well. And then Kelly, thank you so much again for uh, taking some time. And you said... You're, you've got another session tomorrow of which you're going to go a little bit more detail on some of the things you went high level on today. Um, the, more, more nagging yeah. and lecturing tomorrow all uh, right. on all of this. Yep, right. I'm gonna share my story of going, uh, of, of, of going with, a, with a password app too. Okay, oh right. My, Rich, my original with. hesitation and where I'm sitting on that now. Awesome. Great. And so uh, again, you will, everybody will receive an email regarding the CPE and you just need to complete the survey that's attached to that and we'll send you the, the certificate. The, you should have been able to download the slide presentation out of the chat. If not, it's going to be emailed to you and uh, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, which is also in the chat. And that will also, that link will also be in the email that you receive as follow up for this. And that will probably hit the channel in two days, maybe three days, because obviously we're going to have five things that we're trying to get edited over the next couple of days. So uh, thank you again, swear, Kelly. You don't swear words. Oh. I don't mind telling you. That's a, that's a miracle. Yay, Kelly. That's pretty good. Good for you. I'm going to mute you before you, uh, before you do. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Kelly, thank you so much. We will see you all in the next session or see you very soon somewhere else. Thanks.